We'll have plenty of time after our presentation to uh, to interact with the projects. Well. We're going to have Mayor Robinson do a brief welcome, and Commissioner Bender is going to say a few words, and then we're going to hand over to Terry, our project manager. So, Mayor. Welcome tonight to the city's best facility on uh, on the greater Carpenter's Creek. And I'm going to say Carpenter's, because I always grew up, it's got an S on the end of it. I don't know whether it's possessive or plural, but I know it has an S on the end of it. Uh, but anyways, happy... For you to be here at this facility, I think it, 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 when you get a chance to look the other way where I'm looking, you definitely see why this is an important uh, project for us. Water quality and maintaining the quality of life we have here and the, the visual effect of what's in front of us is, is so much a part of who we are here in Pensacola. And so we are very happy uh, to be here as a part of this. I would know a few of you I saw that I remember being in Washington High School that night in the uh, drama department. Uh, as we kicked off uh, this event, and I know uh, Matt is probably, uh, we talked earlier, I said, you're tired of me calling you constantly saying, when are, when are we going to be done with this so we can start actually doing some work? But, uh, but again, a lot of people work really hard uh, to do this. Again, there are a variety of things on here. I think it kind of moves us in the right direction. Is it perfectly going to solve everything? No. But I think if we can come out of here and begin to look at some things uh, that are different things, you know, that will improve water quality overall, what's happening both to the creek and then the bayou, it will be a good thing. I think that will be what's exciting. It's what I always knew uh, when, I, when I chose this project, I thought it was that important to this area. I thought it was a great thing. Um, let me introduce you uh, to the man who's taken over and made sure that we've gotten to this point uh, right now. And I, I very much appreciate the work he's done uh, in shepherding this across to where it is. Uh, Robert Bender, Commissioner Bender, thank you very much. And I unfortunately have to leave to go to the other meeting, but I'm going really, to leave this one to you. Thank you, Mayor Robinson. And of course, uh, thank you for getting it started. I, I'm glad I get to continue what you started. Uh, and I think. Grover, I think um, you called Matt so many times that he decided to get out of this and become the executive director at the Estuary Program. So, uh, but he's still involved, and we're glad to have him. Um, but really, uh, thank you all for coming. It, this is a we're very happy to see that this many people are interested. Um, you know, we had a meeting a few weeks ago with with Wood, um, talking specifically about Davis Highway, and they just uh, did a little bit of overview about this creek. And I would say that um, some of the problems that we're here to fix. Um, they they are decades in the making. Uh, you know, from the time that we, they started developing the area, uh, I think it was like the 40s and 50s, uh, just some minor tweaks that occurred in the 60s and 70s. Um, and so uh, I would say that not all the problems have occurred under our watch, but we're, we're here to fix them tonight. And that was with the start of, of Mayor Robinson uh, and the restore projects that we're, that we're looking forward to. So, uh, and I think that's the thing is that uh, you know, thank you all for sharing your stories about what you remembered about the creek, the swimming holes, um, trying to, to find exactly where those were um, so that they can be uh, memorialized and, and uh, hopefully uh, we can return the creek uh, to those glory days uh, again. Uh, and so I think we, we've had a great team. Uh, the projects that, that we have out uh, showed what we're trying to do and um, improve all the quality, uh, fix some of the things that need fixing. Uh, but, uh, and so I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to, to Wood and let them start those. Um, but please, thank you for coming. Please give us feedback. Um, this is um, this is to involve you all in this process. And, uh, and again, thank you for being here. I'm actually gonna turn it over to Terry first. <laughs> That's because she wants to be, hear me say my name, Terry Berry, because no one ever forgets it. And I get to thank my husband for that. So, and, and I'm glad we didn't have children, because when we talked about having children, I said, well, we can name a blue and, and a cherry. So, uh, so the Lord didn't bless me with children, so I didn't have to put them through that. Anyway, my name is Terry Berry, and we are I'm a project manager for the Department of Creek Project. And we are very excited to show and share with you what we've been doing for the past two years. And uh, this project, as you know, is a joint project between the city of Pensacola and Scandia County, and it's funded by the store. So we're very happy with that. Um, the Carpenter Creek Watershed Master Plan, that's what we're developing, is this master plan 
Um, it's going to identify concept, project concepts in the city of Pensacola and in Scania County. And we have a huge staff that's working on it. It's not me by myself. We've got a huge staff. And I've got pictures up, up there. We've got the wood picture. Anyway, I'm going to talk about the county staff first. One is me, Terry Berry. And the next is Brent Whiff, and he's going to be walking around. You can talk to him. And, uh, and Commissioner stole my thunder about Matt Posner. I had a little thing in here about, about him. But anyway, I'm going to go ahead and talk about it. Uh, Matt actually started this project. He did a really good job. And then he decided to move on and become an executive director and, and leave us alone. But, but he got me to set the floor work and the groundwork for us. And so we've been able to move forward. So we really appreciate the work that he's done. Uh, also, we have the city contact people. We've got city. We've got uh, Mark Jackson, which I don't think could make it tonight. And we have David Forte that, that made it with us. And then, of course, our Wood. Wood is, is our primary consultant. And if you can see their picture, they've got a huge staff. They're, they're very talented. It's been a pleasure to work with them. And they've engaged several subcontractors. And that includes SCAPE, Wetland Science, and Impact Campaigns. And they're all here, so the, the whole team is here to answer your questions. The projects, we're going to share the top 15 projects um, tonight. And all of these 15 projects actually share or actually meet all of the goals of your store. And some of those uh, goals are to manage water quantity and improve water quality. We want to protect, enhance, and restore wildlife habitat. We want to expand the public access and recreational opportunities. We want to build a more equitable and resilient community. And we're going to foster stewardship by engaging our residents that live in the watershed. And that's what this meeting is about, is to get everyone engaged. And with that, I'm going to hand this over to Chrissy Wood to go over what we've been doing and share some of the projects with you. Thank you. Thank you, Terry. Well, Mayor stole my thunder. I was going to ask everybody, who, who refers to Carpenter Creek by Carpenter with no S? Say it again. Who refers to Carpenter's Creek with an S? Okay, no matter what you call it, we're all talking about the same thing. So, um, I can tell you that this is one of my favorite watershed projects that I've ever worked on. There's so much potential. It's such a beautiful area. And I've never seen such engagement from the community on a watershed plan, so it's really great to see. So, as you know, last time we were here, we were at the high school and we were just kicking off the project. It's been a really long couple of years, and we've done a lot of work in that time. So, we started with gathering data. There's been a lot of great studies that were done before us. We were very thankful for that information. We used that information, and we built on that information. So we identified some gaps in data to get us up to current time. So we worked with the county to get current um, development plans so we could see what has been done just recently. Uh, the county actually went and collected some additional water quality parameters and some sampling sites that helped us with our work. We also collected survey and did some field work. Um, so once we had that information, we had the kind of the history and current assessment on paper, we did some really boots on the ground work, um, some really detailed assessments. And those were threefold. So we, we did a hydrologic and hydraulic model so we could look at local drainage, um, we could look at local flooding issues, we looked at sea level rise, the vulnerability assessment. We also did a really detailed water quality assessment. We looked at all that great sampling data and we, uh, we compared it to regulatory criteria so we could see where there were concerns. And then we developed a pollutant load model so we could see where there's hot spots for nutrients in the watershed. And then we did a detailed uh, stream assessment so we characterized the stream. And we looked at erosion and sediment issues. So a lot of data was done to get us to the point where we are today where we looked at the issues and we made recommendations on programs that the city and the county could implement with the citizens watershed-wide. And we also, as Terry mentioned, we recommended and identified 15 projects, large-scale projects that can really make headway for the entire watershed. So that's where we are today. Uh, so tonight, we're going to hear a little bit more information about the watershed assessments. I'm going to tell you a little bit more about what those look like. Um, and we're also going to talk more about the recommendations, and then we're going to let you all free to roam over to the maps and have your questions answered so you can see what projects we're recommending in your neighborhoods. Um, but first, 
Um, Gina's going to talk a little bit about the community engagement that's been done previously and what we've heard from you all. Thank you, Chrissy. And thank you all so much for um, coming this evening and showing up and contributing your ideas and your stories to the Carpenter Creek Project. Um, it's really enriched the process and I think uh, will help this project see the light of day as a built work and transformative for the creek. So your engagement is critical. We wanted to share a little bit um, of the engagement that we've done on this project. I see many familiar faces in the room and I'm excited that you've returned. Uh, if you've been with us before, you've seen some of the materials um, that we've been using to engage all of you in conversations about the creek and the watershed and the bayou. Uh, you can see the model here that probably looks familiar if you came to our first meeting. We were using that as an interactive model. We're using it again this evening to show the 15 sites that rose at the top and came out of this process. Um, we kicked off the public process with a public meeting, um, much like this one, but we've also done other events. We've done site walks throughout the creek watershed. Uh, we've had different targeted stakeholder meetings um, with key stakeholders, both property owners and agencies within the area that regulate these sites. Um, we've held online meetings. Uh, we've also had an online story map and ideal wall that's been up. So some people have contributed even without showing up to meetings in person. Um, if you've been following our newsletter, uh, you've probably seen John uh, doing the Creek, Creek, Creek Geek series, <laughs> kind of educating about the creek and sharing lessons learned that the team has been developing throughout the analysis process. Um, and we've also done other like, online surveys to kind of collect feedback and understand what this community's priorities <coughs> are. Um, but we're here today, and this is a very important meeting today. Uh, we're going to be sharing the 15 sites, looking at them together. At the end of the meeting, we're going to be asking you to vote on your favorite three sites. So it's an opportunity for all of you to continue expressing your priorities. And that will be very important to the city and to the county as this project develops. These are just some recaps and images from some of the public outreach process. Um, you know, we've done presentations, some of the stories that came out of our story booth, uh, image on the top right, have directly informed some of the cultural and recreational resources that you'll see on the 15 sites and maps. Um, and that model we use is back here today, displaying the 15 sites. We've also had an assessment phase where we receive a lot of feedback online. So we really, again, appreciate all of your feedback. Uh, you know, when, when we were meeting online only, like being able to provide feedback and continue to shape the assessment of the different sites. Uh, some takeaways from this process. Uh, we heard that the community was very interested in kayak access as far up the creek as possible. So that's something we've thought about and tried to incorporate into the site designs. Um, the community is very interested in addressing sediment, litter, and polluted runoff, uh, which are major challenges to creek water quality. Um, and I think all of you seem very interested in finding new places to access the creek and be able to engage the creek and the bayou. So uh, we've tried to incorporate public access in all of the design strategies where appropriate. We heard many of these same kind of recommendations come through our online engagement um, around the, the high level uh, recommendations for the creek and watershed. Uh, again, these same points of feedback around addressing sediment flows, litter, and polluted runoff within the creek. As the commissioner stated, these are issues that have been building for decades, so these projects will take time to undo and remake a new, healthier creek system. Uh, but I think the projects provide the pathway to get there. Um, and I think we've also heard a great deal of interest in incorporating, preserving, and highlighting the cultural legacy of the creek, particularly the stretches from North Davis Highway to Ninth Avenue. Uh, where public access historically was concentrated. So that's a little preview of some of that feedback that you'll see later in the images, uh, but I wanted to pass it over to Jeanette to talk about the watershed assessment phase of the project. Hi, I'm Jeanette, I'm with Wood. Um, well, Gina just told you a little bit about the assessment that went into the project way before we did the recommendations that you'll see on the wall today. Um, so I'm just going to tell you a little bit first about the flooding assessment that we did. Um, is that me? Sorry. Oh, I can do it. No, I can do it. Sorry. Um, so, so the first one of the assessment pieces for the project was for water quantity, aka flooding, flooding assessment in the watersheds. And so to do that, um, that the, that involved the development of a hydrologic and hydraulic model for the watersheds that you can see in the, in the image on the right. And so. Overall, our, our model included the city portion of the watershed that you can see in yellow, 
And also in the red, you can see the unincorporated portion of the watershed. And back in 2019, the city already did a stormwater assessment that included mainly an assessment for flooding. It was flood, it was flood focused. And so we built upon that H&H uh, model, the hydraulic model, to include the unincorporated portion of the watershed that you can see there in red. Um, so once we developed that, we ran models for the 100-year one-day event to kind of see what those floodplains look like throughout. And we also ran sea level rise scenarios for the years 2040 and 2070 to take a look at what, what things might look like in the future. And, and then finally, we just looked at those um, results against locations of known wetlands or critical infrastructure in the city and county. Can you go to the next one? Okay, so this slide shows a zoomed in view of the, un of the unincorporated portion of the watershed since the city's model really kind of already did a full assessment in the city's area of the watershed. So you can see there, the blue polygons are the 100 year, 24 hour floodplains um, that we produce from the model. And that's compared to the 100 year, eight hour storm event floodplains and also um, to the calibration storm event, which I'll talk about in a minute. But really we use the April 2014 storm event that happened here for calibration purposes. We had a lot of data from that uh, storm, both qualitative and quantitative. So you can kind of see, I guess the takeaway here is that our model results do closely resemble the calibration storm event, which is always a good thing when you're modeling. Next. And then for sea level rise, we did take a look at that. So what you're seeing in red is the unincorporated portion of the watershed again. Um, we did run for 2040 and 2070 um, projected you know, storms for sea level rise. Uh, you, can, you can try, I've got some numbers there if you're interested in actual numbers. Some, maybe some people are, but you can, I won't bore everybody with that. What this kind of shows is, this is a, snip, kind of a snapshot from the NOAA sea level rise viewer map that anybody can find online. And so you can see from 2070, it's hard to see, but if you look up the bayou and up the creek along, just along the edges, you can see a coloration change. And that is what's projected to be the area of impact for sea level rise in, you know, along, along that waterway. So you can kind of see it's pretty well buffered, actually. Um, I think I have one more slide there. Oh, okay, can you go back up? Sorry. So basically, um, flip it one back, please, sorry. Okay, so this also shows our floodplains from the sea level rise event, and you can kind of see them in the white colored blobs there. Um, but the, the takeaway here is basically that just like the NOAA sea level rise data pretty, you know, shows, we didn't really have a lot of anticipated impact from sea level rise, at least as far up in the, you know, as you move farther, further and further upstream in the watershed, so that's good news. So, um, that's it for the H&H &H assessment. I'll turn it over to Celeste Lyon to talk a little bit about the water quality assessment that was done. Thank you. All right, so as part of the water quality assessment, we developed a fluid load model to highlight hotspot areas within the watershed where we're seeing high nutrient concentration loads coming specifically from stormwater runoff. Stormwater runoff, yes. So in these two figures, the darker purple and pink areas represent the locations of the highest nutrient loading. Ah. So what we did in these two figures that you're looking at on the left, we have total nitrogen, and on the right is total phosphorus. We overlaid the hotspot areas identified in the pollutant load model with existing water quality average nutrient concentrations. Um, this kind of helps visualize the potential relationship between pollutant load loading and water quality. Ah. So it's kind of hard to see, I'm realizing now on this figure, but in the inset maps, with little squares on each of the figures, um, it's zoomed in on some of the higher areas. So in Carpenter Creek specifically, we were seeing extremely high loading around the Cordoba Mall, Sacred Heart Complex, and University Town Plaza. Um, interestingly, these areas were all developed after 1982, which means they are subject to the stormwater treatment criteria. Um, Really, this is just saying that there is stormwater treatment, but it's not sufficient enough to actually treat the current volume of stormwater, so we're getting high nutrient loads. Um, in contrast to what we saw in the Carpenter Creek area in Bayou Tejar, we actually were seeing our highest nutrient load concentrations in residential areas and recreational areas like parks, such as this one. Um, what's really interesting there is that the high areas of Bayou Tejar are coming from untreated stormwater runoff. So in Carpenter Creek, it was just from a lack of stormwater treatment that existed. It's just not sufficient. And then in Bayou Tejar, there isn't enough stormwater treatment at all. So we're getting untreated stormwater 
draining directly into the bayou. Uh, the main takeaway here is that future projects in the watershed to focus on water quality really should be looking at enhanced stormwater retrofits or installing new stormwater treatment BMPs. And I think, John? Yes, okay, and now I'm going to pass it off to John. Hopefully I'll drive this screen correctly. Uh, so, good. How many of y'all are aware of the fact that Davis Highways are, uh, the creeks are eroding near Davis Highway? There's not. So, it's been in the news a lot, and it's a high profile site, and it's easily viewed from, from the road. So, it's high profile. There's been a, um, you know, quite, a, quite a bit of attention on the erosion that's occurring there. Parking lots falling into the creek. And uh, it warrants that attention, but I'm here to tell you t today that it's part of a much larger problem all along the creek. So this erosion is not isolated to this location. In fact, you can stand right up at this area that's eroding now, and this right area right here is an area that eroded in 2007, or, or before 2007, so it repaired right around that time frame. It's, so if you're standing here in the current erosion, you can see previous erosion. And then if you're able to walk down the creek a little bit further, you'll see a big repair that was done uh, a few years uh, ago, and then you have another ero actively eroding area that's not high profile. That if you walk down Carpenter Creek, it's not just this area between Davis and Airport <coughs> Boulevard. You can walk all the way down to Ninth Avenue and find areas that are eroding actively today and have a history of it. So this is part of a much larger issue. Um, and the reason we know that is we've looked at the, just about the entire drainage network. Uh, all the areas that uh, <laughs> and, and we, we were really interested in classifying the streams based on their, not just their channel characteristics, but also what are their watershed characteristics, how do they receive what, their flow, what happens to that flow once it gets into a valley, <coughs> the valley stables, the channel stables. So we came up with a, a bunch of different stream types based on looking at their biological and physical conditions. But then we also were able to assign impact severity categories, right? So and, and, and it's really straightforward. Anything that's green is a comparatively stable condition. Uh, and we'll talk about what I mean by comparatively. But anything that's progressively red, right? Yellow to orange to red is in really bad shape or highly vulnerable to con continue, continuous erosion. So. Uh, Here's I-110, right, runs right down through just about the middle of the watershed. So we, we classify this area here, and notice this, every, all the green that's available is west of I-110, right? And that's because the development there is a little bit more sparse. Uh, in the areas with the highest amount of development, we have the worst erosion. And I'll get to why that is in a second. And all that sediment that's eroding goes somewhere going into this section and into the bayou. So um, there's three sub-basins that we can talk about. The headwaters, the creek or the middle, and that's sort of the heart of the system, and, and, the, and the bayou to the, to the south. So what's going on? If we look at the pre-development conditions for, for Carpenter, Carpenter's Creek, I'll, I'll put an S on it, uh, <laughs> but the uh, you know, it's kind of shaped like an S. And natural creeks meander. The, this particular system was fed mostly by water that rainfall that would fall onto the, this sandhill forest and work its way through the groundwater system to the creek. It was what we call a seepage ravine. Had nice, dense forests growing on the side slopes. It was a shaded creek. Had nice pools and uh, some, even some gravel exposures on the bed. So. Um, so the key word there is seepage dominated, right? Groundwater flow, long, gentle flow paths for water to get from rainfall to the creek from the watershed. 
So development started, you know, right after World War II and um, continued progressively. But in the 60s, the creek was channelized. So they dug a canal out into it. And that created a scar in the stream bed that's eroding still today. And, uh, but it, it gets worse. <laughs> uh, the uh, development continued apace and continues, you know, through multiple decades subsequent to the, the channel being weakened by that ditch in the 60s. And you can see all this impervious surface now that's come in. What that did was it flipped the creek from being a seepage and groundwater fed system to one that now is fed largely by way more surface runoff than it used to be. Right? So that brings, that shortens the flow pass of rainfall to the creek. That water is able to bring a lot more energy to the valley. <coughs> and that is a major contributing factor, if not the dominant factor, causing erosion all up and down the creek. Now the forest is able to resist that somewhat. There's an existing forest in that bottomland. And what the creek's trying to do, since it flipped its function from groundwater dominated to surface water runoff dominated, is it's trying to build a, the wider floodplain that it needs to accommodate those higher energy flows. And so what it's trying to get to is a condition, instead of having kind of this almost U-shaped or V-shaped ravine plate valley, it wants to build a valley that has a bigger, flatter floodplain, and the creek meanders through that. So when we have an unstable condition, this is an area, I think, between uh, airport and by Bayou Boulevards that's eroding. This is, this is one of the areas uh, the south of Davis that's currently eroding. We really want a condition where the creek has good access to a stable flood, flood plain that's forested, that dissipates energy, and stabilizes the whole thing. Having a building the ground that can support a stable forest is good for the creek in so many ways. So, uh, and like I said, we can have nice deep pools in the creek. The creek will meander through this meander belt. Uh, and, and then you have pools at each bend, that, that nice deep, several foot deep pools. Uh, and we've lost the pools because of all the erosion, what's it do? It fills in the pools, right? So um, we can have some gravel exposures as well, as I mentioned. So this is just a snapshot. This, this is not, I uh, forgot the word. This is a great term, urban stream syndrome. This is not unique to Carpenter's Creek. This happens all over the world where impervious surfaces come into a watershed that once had a lot of groundwater infiltration from rainfall and flips the script and sends excessive energy into the valley. So it's so common it actually has a name, urban stream syndrome. So what do people do about urban stream syndrome? Well. In the case we have sort of a gullified system that's actively eroding, you give the stream what it needs. And we can do that on Carpenter's Creek. We have the room to do it. And the way that will happen is there's existing forest flanks that will, that will be preserved. And we'll have to work in between them to give it the new forest and floodplain that will develop. And we'll meander a creek through that. So that's, that's called a priority two restoration. One of the more common treatments to do when you have these symptoms. Okay, so the result of that, the result of all this erosion, as I mentioned, it goes where? The lower parts of Carpenter Creek and into the bayou. So if we want to flip the script on the bayou, we've got to control the erosion. And we'll get a much better outcome for, for the bayou once we, we improve the water quality and the uh, sediment flows going to it. And with that, back to Christy on watershed wide strategy. Okay, so while I'm talking through the next part, Sophie's going to be handing out some post-it notes. Um, so just be aware if somebody's handing you a little post-it notes, just take them, we'll explain what they're for here in just a little bit. So, so uh, Jeanette, Celeste, and, and John told you about the watershed assessment. So we identified uh, a lot of really good things within the watershed and the creek and the bayou. We also identified some issues. So in order to really effectively address the issues that were identified, we need large watershed scale uh, strategies. <coughs> uh, on. Right back. 
Okay. All right. I'll project. <laughs> so we told you we identified projects, but we also need watershed scale strategies. We need the county and the city and the citizens to work together. There's ample opportunities for projects to be implemented on private properties, on public properties, simple things such as adding pervious pavers, um, bioswales in your neighborhood, um, looking at rain, at, at a dumpster program, so dumpsters that are placed adjacent to the creek, uh, that rainfall is running off and draining into the creek. Um, you know, all of these things can be implemented watershed-wide, all the way from uh, the upper reaches all the way down to the shoreline. And that's the kind of effort it's going to take to really make change in the watershed. So in addition to the water quality components and, the, and managing the sediment and erosion, um, we've talked a little bit about public access and recreation. So you'll notice on the concept plans that we've made recommendations for uh, 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 blue ways and green ways and, thank you. Is that better? Oh. So you'll see that there's um, improvement recommendations for bicyclists, pedestrians, and kayakers. <laughs> So that's all really exciting. We'd really like your feedback on those. Um, the idea is to, to improve access to existing, um, existing um, resources already within the watershed, but also to add um, access to some of the new resources that we're recommending. Um, you'll also notice um, call-outs on the plans for creek windows. You might think, what is a creek window? <laughs> So it's, it's a low impact way of adding access or passive access to the creek or resources within sensitive areas of the floodplain. So it's not something you're gonna be able to go walk around in necessarily, but it's something where you'll be able to have a view or a vista um, to see um, the, the bayou or the creek. One more more. And we've also made um, recommendations for um, educational opportunities and interpretive signage for cultural resources. Um, you won't, you'll see some of that on the plans, but we've also made a lot of um, watershed-wide recommendations within the actual plan, you know, um, the document. So there's a lot more in the document that's not necessarily shown on these plans, but we felt that that is a really important um, strategy, is to provide education um, for cultural resources, as well as some of the new implementation. So if we're recommending an LID retrofit at a school, let's put some signage up there. Let's educate the young people um, on the value that that's providing for their water. So um, next slide. Okay, so we've talked a lot about the 15 <coughs> sites. So again, it's these large watershed wide strategies, LID retrofits, along with the 15 or more large-scale projects that are really going to give you a resilient community. So we might not ever get back to the pristine creek and bayou that you had ages ago. What we're hoping to get to is a new system, a healthy ecosystem, a healthy system that's resilient and can sustain itself. Um, so when we looked at projects, we looked at three impact areas. We have the headwaters um, in the upper reaches, and then we have the creek in the middle section, and then the bayou. So you'll notice that that's how they're organized um, on the tables and on the wall. Um, when you go to look at the plans, and I saw some of you looking at them earlier, um, there's a lot of information on there, a lot of information. So you might think, how can I read these? So um, I'll just start with um, the plans are the plans. There's a lot of information on there. On the left side, are, there's little bubbles with little numbers. The numbers are color-coded based on our restore goals. So some of the recommendations might have multiple benefits. They might, uh, they might benefit resiliency and water quality, but we color coded the bubbles on where they have the most impact. So blue would be water quantity or quality, um, green is public access and recreation. So that's kind of what the color coding means. So um, reading the words on the left will tell you really what is shown <coughs> on the plans. And then the little square in the upper right, that's going to tell you the benefits. So we went through all of the projects, and if it was a flood project, we ran the H&H &H model to see what the benefits were, how we were reducing flooding. 
Um, if it was a water quality benefit, we ran our blue glow model and we calculated how much nitrogen or phosphorus was going to be removed from the system. If it's a stream restoration, we calculated how many miles of stream segment were going to be restored. Um, also acreage of wetlands that were going to be improved. So, so that really kind of tells us what we're, you know, what kind of impact we're going to have if these projects are implemented. All right, so John's going to come back up here and tell you a little bit more about the projects. Thank you. So let's start with the headwaters and we'll work our way down valley from there. And the uh, headwaters are kind of like the artery. I want to use kind of a cardiovascular analogy. You're going to hear me go back to that. So these are the capillaries or, uh, of the system. It, it probably is the best uh, analogy. So they're in intimate contact with the land. And as I mentioned before, most of the creek segments uh, in the headwaters area is still in reasonably good shape. So it's a matter of conserving <coughs> and protecting what's there today. But I have to tell you, it's at a tipping point. The level of development that has occurred to date there is just skimming the edge of what crosses the threshold for which the existing forests can resist. Okay. So it's, it's very important, I think, that time is of the essence to start doing a lot of programmatic things that Chrissy was talking about in a part of the watershed, but also to strategically add additional uh, post-curb and gutter drainage, stormwater runoff treatment, and there are some areas that the creek uh, or some of the tributaries are in really bad shape on. Let me give you an example there. So this is um, the Beauclair, Beauclair Apartments, and there's a need to do kind of that same sort of what I call priority two stream restoration, or give it the floodplain that it needs, because this creek, this section of the creek is eroding pretty massively. And you can see it has got a lot of dense development around it. So that's what's causing that. Uh, so we can go in and give it the, the attention it needs within the water body, but then there's a layered strategy in its contributing area. So we want to manage the, the stormwater where we can with sort of conventional uh, wet detection ponds, other, other kinds of stormwater treatment uh, for water that reaches that, like in between curb and gutter and the creek, right? So there's another kind of treatment that we call distributed treatment or sometimes called green infrastructure. And we try to treat the first inch or two of rainfall before it reaches curb and gutter. So those are the three layers, in the water body, after curb and gutter, and before curb and gutter. So um, a lot of that work can be done in a way that it becomes a, an aesthetic, uh, pleasing part of the local communities. And so we can build some recreation components into that. And there's some multiple trails, some interesting nature areas to visit that we either protected or restored. So, uh, moving further down valley, now we're into what we call the creek site, right? It's creeks throughout the whole project, but we call it, this is the creek, right? It's Carpenter's Creek. This is the heart of the system. And, uh, and it runs from a little bit upstream of I-110 all the way down to, to 12th Avenue, right? So most of that, everything upstream at night, the, the I-110 is that area that I was talking about earlier that's very significantly eroding. It's putting something on the order of 40 times the natural sediment load to the bayou from those areas. So um, we need to address that directly. And, and, and so that's, that's the, the, the core of, of this project. But, uh, or excuse me, what the project I'm going to talk about next. There's, there's several projects in that area, but this is the one I want to really focus on, right? So that's that classic reversal uh, or uh, giving the creek what it needs. And then, uh, so that you could almost view uh, like um, open surgery on that part, right? It needs that kind of intervention because the damage is so heavily sustained in that area and it's going to progressively get worse if we don't intervene. And, and then you also, once you repair the heart, you want to put the patient on a better diet. <laughs> well, no, I need, need a better diet. But you know, if you put them on a low cholesterol diet or a Mediterranean diet or something like that, that basically knocks the top off of that extra energy that the creek receives. It just is part of a layered solution that leads to greater overall resiliency on it. So um, this area is very exciting in terms of its potential for generating recreation 
We can have blue ways, kayak launches. We can put a better creek in there. The green ways, multi mobile trails. There's a lot of potential for recreation, really exciting recreation in this area too. So one of the things I will point out that I think also is pretty special is uh, and, uh, Jetty Swimming Hole. So we just, we know an approximate location for that. Uh, and we actually have laid out an area where there's a very particular way we can make the bends work to get a nice deep pool. We want to restore something akin to a baptismal or a potential baptismal pool there. For those of you who don't know the history, this was an area that um, was used by the community for a long time for that purpose. It was a great swimming hole, and we have the ability to restore something there and acknowledge its history. So uh, that's something the community wants. It can happen. The uh, so. Continuing down the valley, we get into what we call the bayou sites. Now the bayou sites are scattered around the bayou, right? So the bayou is getting a lot of untreated stormwater, as Celeste mentioned. And so we want to provide some retrofits, treat that stormwater uh, better before it reaches the bayou itself. So this particular treatment distributed across several sites where you have concrete flumes that just straight shoot the water into the bayou and treat it. We can provide some end treatment there. And we can do it in a way that's pretty interesting. We can do it in a way that uses native vegetation uh, as part of the, the solution, and that can be done in a way that has a nice landscape look to it and would serve kind of a dual purpose. So one of the things that would benefit the bayou tremendously is to have a much better native unmowed buffer along the along the water body itself. Because with a mode buffer, fertilizer just runs straight to it. So uh, having a, a buffer that you can see over, and so homeowners can still get their great views of the bayou, I think is pretty key to success. Uh, restoring the health of the bayou. So um, these will be like demonstration. People can see, try it on for size, just see what it might look like on their property and then get engaged in a voluntary effort to implement some of that on private property. I think one thing that's very key to understand here is neither the county nor the city owns nearly all the property. It, you know, it, a lot of work has to occur on private property to, to be successful in this worship. So it's going to be it's exciting to see all you people here are interested in this, this watershed and this creek system and the bayou because um, you know, a lot of you are going to be asked to contribute directly to the solution, right? It's, uh, it's a community scale solution that's required. Thank you. Uh, yeah, and before I move on from the slide, I just want to recognize all the work that has already been done. Um, so I was talking to the young lady in the back over here. She was saying for 20 years, um, you know, there used to be a lot of fish killed in the bayou. There used to be a lot of, uh, the bayou was in pretty bad shape. So um, there's a lot of groups who have been working hard on treating these outfalls. I know the city over the past few years has implemented a lot of um, end treatment. So what we're recommending is just to address any of those that are, un that are still left untreated. So it's, it's, like I said, a watershed-wide process. It's no one site that will um, restore this watershed. <laughs> so the exciting thing is we can get to a healthy system. We really can. So um, if all of the projects that we've recommended, and, and we suggest you don't stop there. I mean, there's probably other opportunities for project. We had a very specific, limited scope of work for our project. Um, there are many other things that the county and city and citizens can do. But if all 15 of the projects we've recommended um, are implemented, um, you'll have a significant impact on the health of the system. I mean, we can restore um, almost two and a half miles of stream, um, 27 and a half acres of wetland. We can remove 2,315 tons per year of sediment. I think most of you can, if you've been out on the creek, you see the sediment movement is a big problem. You've heard John talk about the erosion and the system just trying to get to a more sustainable system. So that, those are huge, huge impacts. 
Um, you can also, we can also add, you know, increased recreation and access to the creek, creek like we mentioned. So five new kayak launches and uh, over 10 miles of bike improvements throughout the watershed. So that's pretty significant. Um, so the next steps for our project, um, like I said, we're here at recommendations. Um, we're here to get some feedback. We're going to ask for some, in, some feedback on catalytic projects. Jane's going to um, tell you exactly what those blue cards are for here in just a minute. Um, our very next step is we're going to do a regulatory review. So we're going to look at the regulatory criteria that falls within the jurisdiction of the watershed. So city, county, DEP, you know, DOT, all those things. And we're going to really kind of look to see and make sure that everything's aligning um, for the healthy system. And then we're going to uh, take a look at the water quality monitoring program. Um, that's happening within the system. So there's a great robust system. We'd like to make some recommendations for maybe some additional sites where if projects are implemented, um, they can have a pre and post monitoring um, sites already set up. So those are our next steps. Um, and then Gina's gonna tell you about this project. Great, thanks Chrissy. So um, we wanted to spend some time today and talk a little bit about today's workshop. Um, one of the uh, kind of critical, critical things that we're going to do um, in today's workshop, if you do anything, even if you have to get out and go home right now, you have three post-it notes in your hand, right? Does everyone have three post-it notes? If you don't, please raise your hand so people will get you some. Um, we're going to ask that uh, you use one of the markers in the side of the room to write numbers one, two, and three on them. And, oh, you only have one? All right, we have some people that don't have three. So. Raise your hand if you don't have three. Great, okay. <laughs> yeah, just make sure you're flipping through them. They might be stuck together a little bit. Um, great, okay, we got three. If you don't have three though, make sure you get three. Uh, one of the most important things is to understand what the community's priorities for these different 15 projects are. So we're hopeful that you will uh, provide a first place, second place, third place of your priorities for projects. Um, which ones are your favorite? Which ones would you like to see implemented first? Which ones are your priorities as a community? And place them on the wall in the back. And so you can see some people who had to leave early have already started to do that. So it's very helpful for us to like see how the post-its begin to stack up and which projects begin to rise to the top as community priorities. If you want to add further comments about the projects, you can write on the note cards additional comments on how you might like to see a plan tweaked or what about it makes you vote for that project. But those three post-its are your top three votes for this work. So if you do anything tonight, please do that. Those uh, projects that come from this process and our conversations with the city and the county uh, will be called catalytic projects. Uh, and we'll do a little bit more detailed design development of those projects. Um, and they'll be just very helpful to know what the community's priorities are. Yeah, is there a question? You don't have three? I, I, no, I have a question. Oh, yes. So, out of the priority that you have, right, after you post one of those songs there, will that determine, like, what's done first, and then will the others also be lagged back because of that? I think all 15 projects are important, and that's why they're here. This, I would say these priority projects are simply a, um, an understanding of what the community's priorities are. It doesn't mean that they will be first or that they'll cause other projects to go slower. They're just part of the overall project assessment. You know, It was important for the team not just to say, here are the scientific reasons these projects should move forward, but also have the you know, other hand, you know, have the scientific rationale, but also have the community rationale of what priority projects are. So at the end of the day, we have 15 great projects. I think you know Chrissy showed the positive impacts of all 15 moving forward. And even in the room, we have some potential funders and implementers and agencies that can make this work happen over time. So the goal is to improve the watershed as comprehensively as possible. So that is one of the activities. There's a couple other activities this evening, though. So um, you know we didn't have time to walk through all 15 sites tonight on the presentation. That would probably take hours because they're complicated and they're all interesting and they're all great. Um, so what we would like to do is break up the meeting, um, have people mingle around, and go to different stations. And so 
Um, you're welcome to kind of go wherever you like, sit wherever you like, stand and look at whatever you like. Um, we're all sitting here with little X's are today on the, the right side of the screen. On the left side of the screen are the four tables um, shown here. And so you can see the different tables laid out. Sophie is standing by our model table. And so if you want to get oriented and look at all 15 sites with the topography of the watershed and the creek, go to that table and check out those different 15 sites. Um, we have three individual tables where all of the project team will be sitting and answering questions about the different sites in those zones. So we have a creek table in the middle, in the back. We have a bayou table here in the front. And we have a headwaters table in the back. And so there'll be members of the skate and the wood team and the entire consultant team uh, there to answer questions about those individual projects. So there's three projects in the bayou. There's five projects in the creek, or seven projects in the creek, and five projects in the headwaters. Did I get it flipped? Say this, looking at me. Okay, I got it flipped. <laughs> but um, you, there's also an overall orientation map on the model and on the far left of the wall. And all 15 projects are spread along the wall there. They're clustered from the first, the headwaters, seven projects, the creek, five projects, and the body, the three projects. And that, that adds up to 15 priority projects. <laughs> Great, okay. So, um, as I said, if you do anything, please vote on your priorities before you go, but we do hope that you stick around and spend a lot of time with us this evening talking about the sites. We have worksheets that you can fill out if you wanna provide further info. If you have a site that you don't like or you don't think should evolve, put that in the notes, fill out a worksheet, talk about it. So we're here to hear positive feedback, we're here to hear negative feedback, we just want to hear your thoughts as a community about this watershed plan. And if you have additional thoughts, you know, you're taking a shower in the morning or you're driving home and you have a new thought you want to add, we have um, the ability uh, to email the team at restorethewatershed.com uh, additional feedback by Sunday, May 8th. So we're looking to collect all the community feedback um, by this upcoming Sunday. So before we break, uh, if you have questions about particular sites, please save them for the tables. But if you have questions about the overall project or the process, we'll take like a couple, just a couple minutes now before we break to answer any overall questions. Will you let them know that we'll email out copies of the slides? Oh, great. And copies of the projects too. Okay, great. So there'll be an email that circulates that shares all of the projects, just as you see them here tonight, and a copy of the slides in case you want to review the deck. I saw a question here. Curious, just in general and related to things because it crosses right about in the middle of this. What in the world is taking place with the bridge reconstruction on Ninth Avenue over the creek? On Ninth Avenue or Davis Highway? Ninth Avenue. Terry, do you want to take that? <laughs> I'm Terry. I'm not real familiar with what's going on at Ninth Avenue, but I do know that that's an FDOT project. And so FDOT is working on that along with um, the Davis Highway project. So that is something that is, I think, both of those are uh, city limits, but we are keeping an eye on it in the county. And just the other day, we had a meeting at Davis with the, the city and the county and uh, FDB uh, to keep an eye on it. And, and we're going through the pro progress to make sure those are moving, moving as planned. Well, we know what happens on Davis. Should we all be more concerned now? <laughs> well, Davis right now, they have the lines to, you know, to start that construction on the site. And we did have, uh, obviously, there's a lot of soil that's exposed. And anytime we see uh, soil exposed like that, that, that raises eyebrows and concerns. Uh, we're here in Pensacola, and, and we've got rainy season coming up. And as soon as that rain hits, we all know what's going to happen to, to that bank. So we have reached out to DEP. I called, called and talked to them this afternoon. They have reached out to the uh, contractor. I do know that the contractor went out, and I haven't seen a person that went out and put in outside of BMPs, and that they are keeping an eye on it to make sure that, that they are doing what they need to do. So, so on the Ninth Avenue, there's, uh, they're pretty far along the project. Uh, we are, uh, as part of the discussion we had when we talked about Davis Highway a couple weeks ago, um, as, a, as a large group in City Hall, uh, was we we're going to, the city and the county are going to uh, talk to our consultants 
um, see what type of recommendations we can do uh, to the bridge uh, as it's in, in construction now. Uh, I talked to the FDOT secretary and asked him to, to please expect a letter from us um, with some recommendations uh, that, uh, again, uh, as far as they are in the process, that, that we might be able to do because, um, you know, we do see that as a pinch point. Uh, and so, um, you know, of course, uh, their uh, priority is, is the safety of the, of the bridge and the traffic, um, but we also see what that does to the creek, and so uh, that's why we're trying to work together with them. Um, so hopefully we can still implement some things that can improve uh, what happens at night that way. Yeah.